So <clears throat> let's get started. We are going to start Mind Over Markets. This is an updated edition. Um, copyright 2013. Give the credit where the credit is due. Written by James F. Dalton, Eric T. Jones, and Robert B. Dalton. We're going to skip through the table of contents or just kind of scroll through the table of contents. Right? This PDF is available in the Discord. So if you have it, I'd recommend having it open. That way you can follow along a little bit easier. But the whole goal. Um, it is posted. You go to the general chat, go to the pins. There's a pin in there from Lord MacGyver and you click, uh, you click, uh, jump and he posted a ton of books in the discord they're all right there all right so we'll start with the preface right why not start with the initial part of the book when Mind Over Markets was first published in 1990, the market profile was relatively new. I was fascinated by the utility because it provided a new way to structure information, a new way to look at the market through a time-sensitive evolving database that records the market's continuous two-way auction process. I had long been skeptical about the analysis that treated all prices as equal. After years of studying market behavior with a membership on the Chicago Board of Trade, and as a founding member of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, I, became, I came to the conclusion that fundamental analysis is generally too long-term, often appearing out of touch with the market. Auction market theory, on the other hand, seemed to offer the most objective means of allocating the constant flow of bids and offers. I embrace the idea that the auctions are mechanisms for price discovery. Mind Over Markets is a practical handbook for developing an understanding of market behavior that will help you trade with the odds in your favor. In the 20 years since it was first published and translated into Chinese and French, my co-authors and I have continued to delve deeper into the application of auction theory to trading and investment decisions. In the first printing, we talked about buying and selling tales in profile structure. We'll get to the mechanics of this concept later in the book, but we mention them here in the new introduction because they represent an example of how our understanding has evolved since the original publication, thanks to the best teacher of all, experience. We still believe in the structural significance of tales, but we have developed a more nuanced appreciation for what causes tales, a more tellingly what causes the lack of a tail, an indication that the market has gotten too long or too short. This understanding, like an understanding evolved over time, it is the context surrounding the indicator that signals a deeper layer of meaning. Factors like volume and tempo provide clues about which time frame is leading market movement. And as you'll discover, discerning time frame influence is one of the most important insights you can develop as an agile brained trader. Um, I'm going to skip this part. Does the profile work after all these years, right? It, it, it's, you know, based off a of review. Um, I do want to read this part about the review, um, but it just kind of goes in. One of the most astute Amazon.com reviews for this book was not intended as a compliment. The reviewer said, Mind Over Markets is too complicated. Those two words capture the reason why most traders fail, as well as the reason why the book in your hands is still relevant, challenging, and insightful after two decades. It is written for serious traders, and it doesn't purport to, a total sol to be a total solution. Ultimately, you must make your own decisions 
as you carefully choose which tools you use and which indicators you follow as you trade. Rest assured that no matter what you decide, there is never a single simple answer. I suggest you compare volume profiles and market profiles side by side, writing down your observations as you see how they mirror and or contradict each other. Constantly ask yourself, what does the ambiguity tell you? Can you identify change before your competitors, mostly laggards, transform opportunity into familiar patterns of consensus? On the long road to expert. In reading this book, you will begin to make progress on your path to becoming a successful trader. Over time, you will transform insights into instincts in the kiln of experience. And those instincts will help you rise above the distracting maelstrom of conflicting information with a broader, more holistic market perspective. You will begin to understand the big picture while also participating in the daily minutia, the hallmark of a professional trader. Developing this level of market understanding is not an easy process. Most people find it impossible to even begin to parse such an overwhelming amount of ambiguous, conflicting information, let alone transcend it. But armed with awareness, you have the ability to separate yourself from your competitors, most of whom are lost in the shallows of price and opinion. You have the opportunity to forge your own path towards expert. Good luck on your journey. That's the preface. This is just an acknowledgement where he acknowledges, you know, thank God for Peter Stottermeyer. Um, so we'll just kind of glance over that. If you want to read it, go for it. Introduction. Jim Kelvin was a retired cattle rancher from Texas. He had developed an interest in futures markets during the years when he would hedge his livestock at opportune prices. After he sold his ranching business, he began to experiment with a few small trades as a hobby. Jim read everything he could find on futures trading. He studied all the technical models, read manual after manual on market analysis, attended seminars, and kept point and figure charts. In time, he felt he had a firm grasp on all the factors that make the market tick and began to look at trading as a serious vocation. He wasn't making money, but he thought he was just paying his dues as he learned the intricacies of his trading system. One morning, Jim got up at 6 a.m., as he always did, and went to his study to turn on his quote monitors and prepare for the market's open. He picked up the Wall Street Journal to see what the bank traders and brokerage analysis were saying about the foreign exchange market. He had been watching the Japanese yen closely because he had felt the recent depth of coverage in the news would surely reveal some good trade opportunities. The U.S. dollar was expected to record new lows because of a slowing U.S. economy and consistently negative trade balances, forcing the yen and other currencies higher. All the foreign exchange-related articles on his quote equipment news service were bullish for the yen. A friend and fellow trader called and commented on how the currencies should rally that day. Jim then checked the 24-day channel model and the 16-32-day to 32 day moving average crossover model, two longer-term technical indicators on which he frequently based his trading. Both had been generating buy signals for some time. Jim glanced over at his charts. Jim glanced over at his charts. That's my spot. And volume numbers and chewed on the end of a pencil. At the end of every day, he conducted a personal analysis of the market structure and wrote down possible trades for the following day. Last night, he had written, Weakening Yen. Look for opportunity to sell. The yen had been in an upward trend for some time, but in recent weeks, volume was drying up. Price was moving higher, but activity was decreasing, and there had been no substantial moves to the upside in over a week. He knew from his ranching days that the less volume was significant. 
when he would auction off his livestock, the price would continue up until the last buyer bought. When the auction was nearing its end, the bulk of the buyers would have dropped out because they had fulfilled their inventory requirement or the price was too high. When no one was left to buy, the auction was over. He read his analysis again. Common market sense told him that the up auction in the yen was over. There were no more buyers. But what about all the fundamental and technical indicators? All these professionals can't be wrong, Jim said to himself. I can't sell the yen. The market was going to open in less than five minutes. Jim stared at his blank monitor for a moment, thinking about his, what his friend had said. He put his hand on the phone, but did not pick up. The yen opened higher, rose a few ticks, and then stalled. The floor traders were acting on the recent bullish sentiment, but the buyers that had driven the yen up for the past month were nowhere to be found. He just sat and watched his terminal. It's going to break. I should sell, he thought. The flashing green price on his quote screen began to drop as he sank deeper into his chair and indecision tightened its grip. What happened? Jim Kelvin's decision-making process was jammed by the conflict between his own intuition and popular opinion. How can the majority be wrong? The majority of people who trade futures don't make money. In fact, over 90% aren't successful enough to justify being in the market. If you trade with the majority, then you will fare only as well as the average, and the average market participant does not make money. He was caught like a goat that starves to death between two piles of hay. In the conflict of multiple sources of information indicating opposite conditions, Jim's common sense and firm understanding of the market auction process told him that the yen was weak and should have been sold but he let himself be frozen by the power of the majority. All the fundamental and technical indicators agreed. Everybody was predicting the bull trend to continue. The difference is relatively simple. Jim was basing his opinion on current market information. He was listening to the evolving market, while all the other sources were based on information that was history and no longer relevant to what the market was doing in the present tense. What if a baseball catcher waited to see how fast a man was stealing second could run or pondered how often he was successful before he threw the ball? There's no way to the throw would be in time. A good catcher operates solely in the present tense. He feels when the steal is on and reacts immediately. Just as an experienced trader feels the direction of the market and reacts immediately. Similarly, if a linebacker waited until he could see what the offense was doing or tried to read the play by watching the scoreboard, he would never make a key tackle. He reads the offense by recognizing patterns, learn from experience, and by trusting his intuition, sensing the play. To wait is to miss the opportunity. If you wait until the market has committed itself in a direction, you're too, you are too late. In Mind Over Markets, our goal is to teach you how to read the plays. In order, in more concrete terms, you will learn how to identify the information generated by the market, understand its implications, and act on your knowledge. However, this is not a book about a trading system that works or does not work. The market profile is not a black box that dogmatically tells you when to buy and sell commodities. This is a book on learning. This is a book on observing and understanding the market. Mind Over Markets is organized around the five basic steps in the learning process, roughly corresponding to the five stages of skill acquisition discussed in the book Mind Over Machine by Hubbard and Stuart Dreyfus. To include these stages, imagine a young man named David. He attends a concert at his college given by a well-known contemporary pianist. While listening to Beethoven's haunting Moonlight Sonata, he is moved by the pure emotion expressed in the piece and decides he must learn to play the piano. The next day, he arranges for his first lesson. In the first few weeks, David learns to recognize objective facts and features relevant to the skill and acquires rule for determining actions based on those facts and features. In other words, he reaches the first stage of learning, the novice. He learns that black ellipse with a stem is a note, and that note placed on the bottom line of a treble staff is an E. He is shown where the E is on the keyboard, 
and can then press the corresponding key to sound that note. David can look at the sheet of music and by reducing it into an individual part, he can find the right keys and play the song. Of course, this is slow, painstaking process that forces listeners to use their imagination when trying to make out any semblance of melody. After a month of lessons and regular practice, David becomes an advanced beginner. By playing a song over and over, he goes beyond the note-by-note -note struggle and begins to achieve some continuity of melody. Experience improves his performance. He still sees the song as a series of notes on a page, but begins to feel the flow that allows a recognizable song to emerge. David can play Amazing Grace, so it actually sounds like Amazing Grace, and not some array of notes in a random rhythm. As years go by, David reaches the third level and becomes a competent pianist. Most musicians never pass the stage of stage to become proficient or expert. He sees each song as a whole, a certain expression to be performed with a definite goal in mind. He still plays by reading the notes, but he achieves some degree of emotion and purpose in his playing. An important distinction must be made here. David plays with the emotion of the written expression in the piece, crescendos and fortes, etc., not with the individual interpretation. He performs much like a machine that very accurately converts the musical score into a sonata or crescendo. This level of competency can lead to excellent performances. For most, written music thoroughly is thoroughly marked to show the composer's emotion. These marks have literal meaning, such as quiet or pronounced and sharp. David plays Bach's Prelude in E minor flawlessly at a recital and receives a standing ovation for his technical excellence. However, David is still a person playing an instrument, much like a computer running a complicated flowchart. To advance to the next level, proficiency, he must transcend the physical notes on the paper, the rules, and become deeply involved in the music. To reach the fourth level and become proficient, David must learn the actual notes of a piece so well that he no longer has to think of them. The written work becomes part of his mind, a holistic image, allowing him to interpret the music. This comes from experience. In life, as well as hours of practice at the keyboard, the pianist must rely on his intuitive ability to express emotion through the piano, leaving behind the fact that the piece is an E-flat in six eighths time. Therefore, if David is proficient, he will feel the emotion that Bach created and drawing on his own emotions and experience convey that emotion in his playing. I just had to make sure my sounds are calling. Music that surpasses the competent level goes beyond the auditory aesthetic and involves, involves the listeners. Hearing a proficient musician is often a deeply moving experience, where passionate music arises from the emotion of the performer and strikes similar chords in the listener. This cannot be explained in rational terms, for one cannot teach the expression of true emotion. Only through experience and involvement can proficiency be reached. The final stage is labeled by Dreyfus and Dreyfus as expertise. David has studied piano for many years and knows the instrument inside and out. When he plays the piano, when he plays, the piano becomes an extension of his body. It is as if the music comes straight from his mind, which in an important way it does. He no longer thinks of individual notes or any rules when his hands are on the keyboard. An expert musician feels the melody, and the song lives as an expression on his feeling. The mechanical aspects are fully ingrained, leaving the brain to its wonderful powers of creation. Listening to an expert musician is like peering into his thoughts and feeling the weight of his sadness or the exhilaration of his joy. It is a mode of expression that transcends all rules and calculative rationality to become pure expression. Few people reach the expert level in any field.
This example was meant to introduce you to the basic levels of skill acquisition that we will attempt to take you through in learning to trade the futures market successfully. However, learning is a process that requires a great deal of time and effort, and learning to be an expert trader is no exception. The musician the musician spends many hours of rote memorization and practice to develop expertise or experience and skill. Success trading requires the same discipline and hard work. Many perceive futures trading to be a glamorous, high profit venture for those with the nerve to trade, and that through the purchase of mechanical systems and computer software, you can bypass the time and dedication it takes to succeed in other professions. In reality, there are few glamorous professions. Some, like the music industry, reward the best quite impressively. It is easy for the naive music lover to glamorize performers like Burt, Bachara, Frank Sinatra, and Billy Joel. However, if we dig deep behind the sellout stadium concerts and multi-platinum albums, the music business is not much different than any other profession. For every Simon and Garfunkel, there are literally millions of aspiring young, young musicians who spend endless hours of dedication and frustration learning and perfecting their profession. Even the established superstars spent uncounted days perfecting each song on their musical ability to achieve recognition. Because of the difficulty of making it big, many musicians burn out. The process of becoming good enough to succeed brings with it the potential for failure. The process of becoming an expert trader is just as difficult. The learning in this book goes beyond technical systems into the areas of self-understanding that might reveal weakness in your abilities of self and market observation, discipline, and objectivity. Also, much of the information in this book differs from the accepted models of market analysis. Just as you will learn that the best traders fly in the face of the most recent market activity, the information in this book flies in the face of most current opinions and theories on trading and understanding the market. Futures trading is not a glamorous or profitable experience for most of the people who attempt to trade. Futures trading is a profession, and it takes as much time and dedication to succeed as any other profession. You will start as a beginner, learning the objective basics of the profile, then proceed through the stages toward the ultimate goal of any profession in any trade, becoming an expert. Chapter two, novice. Let's take a two second, two minute break real quick so I can grab some water. If anyone's got questions, right? I'm in. We'll, we'll take a, you know, a break and review them. I've got a, another document up that way. I'll add all the questions on there, and if we can't get into it today, right, because I've you know, got to pick up the kids this afternoon, then we'll definitely pick it up where we left off tomorrow. All right, chapter two, novice. Novice is the first stage in any process. No one starts out an expert or even an advanced beginner. To learn any skill, you must begin by learning the necessary objective facts and features the tools with which you will build your skill from the ground up. Just as a carpenter learns the function of a saw, hammer, and plane before attempting to make his first basic bird feeder, you must learn the mechanics of the market, excuse me, of the market profile before you make your first basic market decisions. The learning that occurs during the novice stage is largely rote memorization. The carpenter is taught that the workings of his tools, the aspiring pianist is taught the definitions that form the base of all music theory. This learning comes from a derivative source, such as a book or a teacher, and does not involve the novice in any active way as he or she sits and listens or reads. Some degree of derivative learning is necessary, especially during the early stages. But in the words of ancient 
Greek philosopher Heraclides, much learning does not teach understanding. Only through experience and extensive practice and application will understanding and expertise arise. Throughout this book, A Derivative Source, there are many definitions and patterns to memorize. It is important to remember, however, that the information is only part of a larger whole that will develop as you read and attempt to assimilate what you have learned with your personality, individual trading style, and experience. Keep an open mind and actively apply the new knowledge to your observations of the marketplace. Perhaps some of your established beliefs have already been thrown into question. In the example at the beginning of the book, Jim, the yen trader, is torn between the different sources of information, fundamental and technical, fundamental technical and market-generated information. All the fundamental sources, newspapers, trade magazines, personal advice and technical sources, channel models, moving averages, were predicting a rally in the foreign currencies. The market-generated information, information which is the market's price activity recorded in relation to time in a study with a st statistical curve was indicating that the market had reached the top of an up movement. This is not to say that all technical gurus, financial writers, and market analysis are useless. There is just no greater indication of what the market is doing than the market itself. The market profile is a conduit for listening to the market. It is merely a graph that plots time on one axis and price on the other to give a visual impression of market activity. This representation takes the form of a statistical bell curve, just like your high school teacher used. Most students scored in the middle of the bell curve with C's, while fewer received A's and F's. Similarly, the majority of the days Transactional volume takes place in a common range of prices with less trading on the day's extremes. See figure 2.1. So we'll scroll down. This is figure 2.1 here. And you can kind of see what he's talking about. The market profile is simply a way of organizing market activity as it unfolds. It is not a system that predicts tops and bottoms or trend continuation any more than a teacher's grade chart is an indicator of overall student intelligence. The market profile is an evolving gauge that accurately reflects market activity in the present tense, a gauge being defined as a passive device that exist only to measure something. The key to the market profile lies in correctly reading this information. The statistical bell curve is employed to allow us to visualize what a graph might look like that plots time, a constant, on a horizontal axis against price, a variable, on a vertical axis. Scientists have employed this method of analysis for generations. Its utilization in markets, market analysis creates a distribution curve that allows for us to organize the data and better understand the continuous two-way auction process. The graph of the market profile is seldom bell-shaped. There is more often a skew to the profile. However, this fact does not detract from the value as a teaching tool to understand the foundation foundational principle of the market profile laying the foundation in this section we will discuss the definitions and concepts that form the foundation for learning to understand the market through the market profile as has been stated before this is a challenging task everything you learn about the market profile is interrelated and integral to the complete understanding of the market each concept is like a piece in an intricate puzzle that should be studied to determine its place in the developing picture. If you file away each piece separately, or hang on, if you file each piece away as a separately defined definition, you'll be left with a jumble of seemingly unrelated facts. But if you continually integrate each section of the book with what you have already learned, the picture slow, will slowly emerge.
the auction. Jim Kelvin intuitively knew that the bull trend in the yen was over because his days in the ranching business. At first glance, a futures market seems to have very little to do with cattle ranching. However, there are both markets and all markets share a common auction process through which trade is conducted. As Jim Kelvin sat before his quote monitor on that morning, he recalled one of the last days he took his livestock to the auction. Price for feeder cattle had been steadily climbing for several months, reaching a high of 86 cents, but the number of steers sold had fallen significantly during the previous week's auction. The meat processors had to cut back their purchasing to bare minimum at higher prices, buying just enough to keep their processing plants operating and meet their contract obligations or meet their contract obligations. Jim knew that price would have to auction lower to find renewed buying. A steer was led into the middle of the auction barn. The sale barn manager at one of the circular corrals called out the starting price. Do I hear 80 cents for this fine feeder steer? The opening call was too high and did not get a raise from the men standing around the perimeter of the circle. 78, 76. Do I hear 74? Finally, a buyer entered the auction, starting the bidding at 72 cents. After a small rally as buyers called out their offers, the steer was sold at 76 cents a pound. The up auction over the last few months in the cattle market had ended. Price had to auction lower to attract buyers. During some auctions, there would be an immediate response to the opening bid. And the price would move up quickly. Do I hear 82? I have an offer for 82. Do I hear 84? 85? As the men around the perimeter of the ring cried out their offers. Other times the initial price would be too high and the auctioneer would quickly lower the bid. Do I hear 78? 77? 76? For this fine steer. The price would back off until a buyer entered the auction. Then price would begin to move upward, often auctioning beyond the opening price. Once the auction got started, competition and anxiety among buyers sometimes drove the market beyond the prices that were initially rejected as too high. Price would continue up until only one buyer remained, 92 going once, twice, three times, sold. The auction was over. Yeah. The futures market auctions in a similar manner. If the open is considered below value, price auctions higher in search of sellers. If the open is considered too high by the market's participants, price auctions lower. Searching for buyers. Once a buyer enters the market, price begins to auction upward until the last buyer has bought. Similarly, the market auctions downward until the last seller has sold, constantly searching for information. As you progress through the book, the importance of the market's auction process will become evident. And with the aid of the market profile, you will soon see that the futures market auction process is by no means a random walk. Organizing the day. The basic building blocks of the market profile are called time price opportunities or TPOs. Each half hour of the trading day is designated by a letter. If a certain price is traded during that given half hour, the corresponding letter or TPO is marked next to the figure or next to the price. Figure 2.2 shows each half hour segment separately alongside a completed profile. You can see here the profile, profile next to it. Each letter representing 30 minutes. That's the open. Um, I think that's the end of the day. One, one second. Hold on. Well, okay.
Um, yeah, I think that's just the end of the day. Or oh yeah, maybe that's a maybe that's a typo. Yeah, because A is right here, so maybe those should have been A's. On a side note, treasury bonds trade in 30 seconds of 1,000, and one tick is worth 31.25, thousand dollars divided by 32. In the bond market on this day, the prices traded during the first 30 minutes A period range from 96 29s 32s to 97 10 32s. The next time period B traded from 96 31 32 to 97 4 32, and so on. The resulting profile is shown in figure 2.2. This, this is it here. We will now proceed through the same bonds step by step. We will now proceed through the same day in the bonds step by step, explaining in detail how to read the basic information generated by the market pro market through the market profile gauge. The numbers in the following discussion refer to figure 2.3. This. Just so we're going we're going to be able to see them. So here's figure 2.3 on this side here. One, the price range resulting from market activity during the first two time periods, the first hour for most commodities is called the initial balance. Slightly longer in the S&P in the treasury bond example. Shown in figure 2.3, the initial balance was established from 9629.32 to 9610.32 by floor traders or locals during A and B periods. If we look up here, A and B period is what they're talking about, the initial balance. The initial balance represents a period of time in which the locals attempt to find a range where two-sided trade can take place, a range where both the buyer and the seller agree to con conduct trade. Locals trade mostly in the day time frame and provide liquidity, not direction. In the market, by acting as middlemen, between the off-floor traders. Their purpose is not to make one... Kevin, you gotta mute your mic, my man. Um, as middlemen between off-floor traders, their purpose is not to make one or two big trades every day, but to make a few ticks on a large volume of trades. The local is typically responsible for over 50% of the day's trading volume. The local's role is like a car dealer, a middleman between the producer and the consumer. The dealer's goal is to move his inventory quickly to make a small profit on each sale. He must buy from the producer, like General Motors, at a price he finds fair, then turn around and sell to the consumer at a price that will attract buying while maintaining a degree of profit. The local on the floor of the exchange acts in the same way. Buying from long-term sellers and selling to long-term buyers, who only enter the market when they feel prices away from value. We will refer to the long-term market participants as the other time frame, for the long-term is a highly subjective concept and can represent a trade that spans anywhere from several days, sometimes called swing trade, to several months. Other separates the traders from those particip participation spans more than one day from the locals who operate solely in the shortest time frame. The importance of the other time frame participants will be discussed at greater length throughout the book, 
or the other time frame activity that moves and shapes the market, just as General Motors and the consumer shape the automotive market. Understanding what the other time frame is doing is vital in successful trading the futures market. In D period, the other time frame seller enters the market and extends the range down 96 quarter to 32, 2532. Any movement in price beyond the initial balance set up by the local in the first hour of trading is called range extension. That signifies that something has changed because the other time frame buyer or seller presence. The local is not responsible for any major moves in the market. It is the other time frame that can move price substantially. Again, in D period, it is evident that the other time frame seller entered the market and extended the range on the downside. Either the other time frame buyer will respond to these lower prices, or the other time frame seller will continue to auction the price lower in search of buyers. So as we scroll back up, you can see in D period, that's what I'm talking about, number two, range extension, as we extended past the initial balance. Number three, the responsive buyer did enter the market around 96, 24, 32, and price balanced around the lower portion of the day's range until K period, an hour before the markets closed, the other time frame seller probed downward once again, beginning with the K print at 96, 25, 32, and extending down to 96, 17, 32, but then was met by a buyer responding to lower prices, forcing price back to the close in the middle of the range. The range refers to the entire height of the profile from the high to the low. On this day, the range was 96, 17, 32 to 97, 10, 32. Number five, all activity below the initial balance is other time frame seller range extension. Just as the activity above in the initial balance is other time frame buyer range extension, in the activity above 97.10.32s or below 96.29.32s is range extension on this day. We have the picture at the same time. We'll, we'll just power on for now. All activity below initial balance is other time frame seller range extension, just as all above activity is in the initial balance is other time frame buyer range extension. Any activity, all right, we already read that. All right, the area where 70% of the day's business is conducted, roughly one standard deviation, is called the value area. This is illogical for the middle part of the bell curve is where most activity occurs and indicates two-sided trade took place in the day time frame. Similarly, in a teacher's grading curve, most students score in the middle ranges which is reflected in the wider middle area of the bell curve. If both buyer and seller are actively participating in an area, then that area is accepted as value by both parties. On July 25th in the bonds, value was accepted between 96.25.32 and 96.332. The value area can be easily calculated using TPOs or actual price volume figures. A sample calculation of the value area is shown in Appendix 1.
this up so we can see the picture at the same time. The single KTPOs at the lower extreme of the profile are called single print buying tail. This is an important reference point for it indicates that the other time frame buyer responded strongly to price advertised below value, rejecting price out of the lower range in one time period. Okay. Competition among buyers for contracts causes price to move quickly. Therefore, the longer the tail, the stronger the other time frame activity. A tail occurring during the last period of the day is not technically a tail, or it cannot be validated by rejection in two subsequent time periods. In addition, a tail must be at least two TPOs long to have any real significance. The four single A prints at the top of the day's range are a single print selling tail. This tail shares the same significance as the other time frame buying tail in K period. The other time frame seller reacted to higher prices quickly moving price lower. Attempts to auction beyond the single print tail by trading up to that price range in subsequent time periods C and D met strong resistance showing seller strength. At those prices, the longest line oh, at those prices, the longest line of the TPO closest to the center of the range is called the point of control. This is the price where most activity occurred during the day and is therefore the fairest price in the day time frame. The greatest amount of the time was spent trading at that price, signifying greatest value. This concept will be further developed later, for it is of great importance in monitoring other time frame activity in the day time frame. M period designates the closing range, which is the market's last indication of overall sentiment for the day. It is used as a reference point against the following day's open to see if, it, if the underlying market sentiment has changed. Challenging the rules. You should now have a feel for reading the basic indicators of the market profile. Many concepts concepts were introduced, some undoubtedly foreign to the opinions you were taught and the rules you learned about the futures market. Roger Von Ort, author of A Whack on the Side of the Head, challenges the power of the rules. There is a lot of pressure in our culture to follow the rules. This value is one of the first things we learn as children. We are told, don't color outside of the lines, no orange elephants. Our educational system encourages further rule following. Students are usually better rewarded for regurgitating information than for playing with ideas and thinking of original uses for things. As a consequence, people feel more comfortable following rules than challenging them. Challenging rules is a good creative thinking strategy, but that's not all. Never challenging the rules brings with it potential dangers. <laughs> Understanding the market profile requires more than just regurgitation of a list of concepts. It requires the ability to challenge the rules and look beyond the restricting confines of popular opinion. Look over the basics we just covered again. David had to know the basics of the music before he could successfully play Amazing Grace. The Role of the Marketplace Consider the purpose of the market for a moment. Most traders don't take the time to understand the very foundation of the market that they're trying to master. The carpenter cannot build a, found, a functional birdhouse if he never stopped to ask himself, just what is the purpose of a birdhouse? The reason for the basic oversight is directly related to Von Ock's challenge of the rules. Most people do not want to know the purpose of the market. They do not want to have to think rationally or objective, and objectively about the bigger picture. Most market participants, in fact, most people in general, would rather be given a set of rules to blindly follow than to have to use personal insight and initiative thought or innovative thought. Again, the majority of people who trade futures do not make money. 
The purpose of futures market is similar to any other market. It exists solely to facilitate trade. And it does so by auctioning from high to low and low to high in order to find an area where trade can be best facilitated. Think of a trade facilitation in terms of your corner grocery store. If the price of peanut butter is too high, shoppers will refrain from buying and the grocer will realize that the price is too high. He will then move price lower until the buyer responds by purchasing the product. If the grocer moves price too low, however, his inventory will be quickly depleted as buyers take advantage of price being below value. Finally, the price will balance somewhere in between the two extremes, where value is established and two-sided trade can take place. Price must move high, too high and too low before both the grocer and the shopper know that it has gone far enough. The same is true in the futures market. The market op auctions up until the buyers, until the buyer will no will buy no more, the down until the seller will sell no more in the process of establishing extremes of price shown in the profile as the tapering ends of the bell curve. Now imagine that figure 2.3 is a profile of the grocer's peanut butter sales over the period of several months instead of treasury bond sales. In theory, not actual price in individual TPOs. Initially, the price was set too high and there were no buyers to generate sales. The grocer then quickly lowered the price to move his inventory as shown in A period, single print selling tail. See point one, figure 2.3. Price went too low in that same period and buyers bought heavily, allowing the grocer to move prices back up in B and C periods. The extremes of price seem to have been established in A period. The value was accepted somewhere in the middle in D period. However, another seller entered the market, a supermarket chain two blocks away. A larger store could afford to charge lower prices, so the local grocer had to cut costs to stay in business. In the following weeks, value was established near the bottom of the previous lower extreme. Value was accepted lower because of the stronger sellers. Finally, the local grocer decided to do a promotional peanut butter extravaganza and substantially lowered the price to attract shoppers. The ploy worked. As shown by the strong buying tail in K period, the buyers responded to lower prices, allowing the grocer to raise them to a profitable level once again. The comparison is intended to bring home the similarity of a trade facilitation process in all markets. The futures market is a constant auction looking for balance between the two major forces behind market movement, the other time frame buyer and seller. Let us look at the role of the other time frame within the marketplace for another perspective for a moment. Looking at something in a different light often brings valuable insight. If Gutenberg had never looked at the wine press as something entirely different, we might not have the printing press today you would not be reading a manual or you would be reading a manual handwritten by a something and paid a lot more for it. Imagine the other time frame seller and the other time frame buyer as two distinct personalities, two separate entities who stand on the opposite sides of a game board in the shape of an exchange pit. They both have their fingers on big buttons. One says sell and the other says buy. In the pit are miniature locals yelling and gesturing as they do their trades. Other time frame participants are battling for market control, and they enter the market when they feel the price has gotten away from value or some external information convinces them to act. For example, a significant news event might cause the other time frame buyer to enter the market and drive price upward for the entire day. It, this example is obviously only an imaginative idea but the other time frame participant often do act as if they were individuals and it is not always possible to tell why they enter the market the point is to successfully trade the futures market you must understand what the other time frame is doing and position yourself with them going with the crowd in a classical candid camera tv show a man waits for an elevator when it arrives everyone on it is facing the back of the elevator. 
So he gets on and faces backwards. If you blindly follow the majority, you will usually be going the wrong way. As we said before, the majority of market participants do not make money. This is a pretty bold statement. But if you stop and think about how many times the big name analysts have been playing wrong, it doesn't seem so far fetched. Nonetheless, when the big movers on the street talk, most everybody listens. It is much easier to dogmatically rely on the expert than to be a rugged individualist who makes his own decisions. When you rely solely on yourself, you alone take pride in reaping the rewards of success. But there is also no one else to blame for the defeat. The tendency to be a follower is not an easy thing to realize or admit. Not surprisingly, one of the primary reasons many traders use a technical or mechanical trading system is to take themselves out of the decision-making process. These are but a few thoughts to keep in the back of your mind as we continue through the novice stage and discuss more labels and terms. Again, the market profile is not a technical or mechanical system, and the discussion to follow should not be memorized for later regurgitation. Remember, everything is part of a larger whole and a little information is a dangerous thing. Organizing the day began with a discussion of initial balance. Initial balance represented the period of time where local traders, i.e. floor traders, searched for a range where two-sided trade would take place. Local traded, locals traded mostly in the day time frame and provided liquidity. Floor trader daily volume often averaged over 50% of day time frame activity. The floor trader attempted to get in between every trade. They attempted to buy from the seller and sell to the buyer. The importance of floors has continually diminished as off-floor electronic screen-based trading has evolved. When floors were more of an integral part of trading, I looked at the base that developed during the initial balance for early guidance. The broader the base, the more stable the market was likely to be. Electronic trading has provided far more transparency for traders. Traders can now view volume at every price. Off-floor traders still attempt to make markets, which increases liquidity. Another improvement is the faster dissemination of news. When floor traders were more dominant and news was slower to reach non-floor traders, the locals had another advantage. Initial balance today is slightly more ambiguous. However, it is still represents early morning market activity. Introduction to the day time frame structure. When the local grocer priced his peanut butter below value in the peanut butter extravaganza, the consumer bought it in a frenzy, leaving in its wake a single print buying tail. Tails are an important piece of the information in the anatomy of the market profile, for they indicate the presence of the other time frame buyer or seller. A tail is an identifiable characteristic with definite implications. Whenever you see that particular pattern, you associate it with a specific set of facts. Just as a linebacker learns through experience that certain formations indicate what the offense is going to do. On a bigger scale, the market profile as a whole tends to fall into reasonable or into readable patterns in the day time frame determined, um, determined, determined by the degree of involvement of the other time frame participant. These patterns, when properly identified, can increase the day trader's success as well as provide information regarding what the market is trying to do in the longer term. The labels we will give these participants are not as important as understanding how the day evolves in relation to the initial balance and the confidence with which the other time frame has entered the market, think of the initial balance as a base for the day's trading. The purpose of the base is to provide support for something, as the base of a lamp keeps the lamp from tipping over. The narrower the base, the easier it is to knock the lamp over. The same principle holds true for futures trading in the day time frame. If the initial balance is narrow, the odds are greater that the base will be upset and the range extension will occur. During that, oh, days that establish a wider base provide more support that the initial balance is more likely to maintain the extremes for the day. 
if you think of the other time frame as a single personality as in the game board analogy it is possible to judge the activity of the other time frame buyers and sellers according to their level of confidence each day type is result start again each day type is the result of varying degrees and forms of other time frame activity and this activity tends to fall into certain patterns keep these broader concepts of base and confidence in mind as we examine the six day types normal day the label normal day is misleading or in reality normal days are more the exception to the rule Normal days are generally created by swift early entry of an other time frame participant, which has the effect of establishing a wide initial balance. Thereafter, both the other time frame buyer and seller, <coughs> both the other time frame buyer and seller auction price back and forth between them. As balanced two-sided trade ensues, Normal days are often caused by news announcement early in the trading session that triggers a strong other time frame reaction. Idea now. so we can see that figure while we're reading this normal days are often caused by a news announcement early in the trading session that triggers a strong other time frame reaction driving price quickly in one direction for example suppose that a bearish economic indicator released shortly after the open causes the other time frame seller to aggressively enter the market and drive price lower eventually price moves low enough to attract other time frame buying thus cutting off the selling activity for the remainder of the day there is a little there is little strong directional convince, conviction and price balances between the extremes as an example of the normal day is shown in figures 2.4 which is this one here Structural characteristics. The primary characteristic of a normal day is a wide initial balance or a base that is not upset throughout the day. In Treasury Bonds figure 2.4, the initial balance was established in A and B periods from 96.432 to 97.1432, well over a point wide. Other time frame sellers entered on the upper extreme because the price auctioned too high, creating a strong single print selling tail while other time frame buyers entered on the lower extreme as price auction too low creating a single print buying tail price spent the rest of the day auctioning within two extremes on the surface normal days might appear easy to trade however imagine the anxiety in placing an order to buy just after price has dropped over a point the bottom appears to be literally dropping out of the market and you have to pick up the phone and say buy it this is not to say that every time the market drops a point you should step in and buy that would be financial suicide but as we proceed through the more common day types and you observe them through your own experience you'll begin to develop an understanding of which day time frame patterns and logical market situations will give you the confidence to buy against such a break we bring this up primarily to touch on the two key principles that you will no doubt grow tired of by the end of this book. They are the best trades often fly in the face of most recent market activity and never lose sight of the bigger picture. Normal variation and normal 
normal variation of a normal day. Dynamics. A normal variation of a normal day is characterized by market activity early in the trading session. That is less dynamic than more of a normal day. As the day progresses, however, the other time frame enters the market and substantially extends the range. It is as if the other time frame participant had watched the auctions for a while and then decided price was opportune and entered aggressively. The other time frame conviction is more evident due to the range extension on this type of day compared to a normal day. In figure 2.5, the other time frame seller. Let me just go ahead and it's over. In figure two point five, the other time frame seller auction price downward in B or in D period until the other time frame buyer responded to lower prices and cut off the selling. For the remainder of the day, two trade is two-sided and a new area of balance is established. Structural characteristics. Normal variations typically do not have quite as wide of initial balance as normal days. Point one in figure 2.5. The initial balance or base is upset on one side by the other time frame range extension, usually early in the day. In figure 2.5, the other time frame seller extended the range down in D period, tipping over the base to the downside. Point number two. For the duration of the day, the market's auction process involves the other time frame buyer other time frame seller and the local referred to the two time frame trade on this day selling range extension causes value to be established lower point three Trend day. There are two types of trend days, the standard trend day and double distribution trend day. The most important feature of a standard trend day is the high level of directional confidence that is evident throughout the day. The other time frame buyer or seller remains in control of the auction process virtually from the day's open to its close. In addition, as a trend auctions higher or lower, it continues to draw new business into the market thus creating unidirectional sustained price movement fueled by higher volume. Structural characteristics. On a trend day, the open forms the upper or lower extreme in a large majority of cases. Figure 0.1, figure 2.6. Because the other time frame is usually in control from the opening bell, in the trend day example in figure 2.6, the other time frame seller extends the range downward during multiple time periods, remaining in control for the entire day, points two and three. Such unidirectional activity is referred to as a one time frame market. During one time frame buying trend day, each time period will auction to a higher or equal price level without auctioning below the previous time period, or previous time periods low. Conversely, in a one time frame selling trend day, each additional time period will be equal or extend below the previous periods without auctioning above the previous period's highs. For example, in figure 2.6, E period extended below D on the downside, thus extending the range to begin the trend day. Then G auctioned lower than E without auctioning above the E high, H lower than G, J lower than L, and so on. One time frame conditions are a good indication of other time frame control and a potential trend day. 
A trend day differs from the normal variation day in that the trend day's profile is generally thinner and more elongated, usually no more than four or five TPOs wide at any point. Fail failure to recognize and accept that one is a trend day is one of the most costly mistakes a trader can make. Several days of trading profits can be lost in one trading session if you are positioned against the trend. It is important to identify early that either the other time frame buyer or seller is in clear control and position yourself with them. Double distribution trend day dynamics. The second type of trend day, the double distribution trend day, is relatively inactive during the first two first few hours of the trading session. Market participants possess a low level of conviction, resulting in a narrow base. Later in the session, a change in events causes the other time frame to perceive price to be unfair at current price levels, enter the market aggressively, and substantially extend the range. This later entry by the other time frame drives price to a new level, where the second balance region develops. The double distribution trend day does not possess the steady confidence of a typical trend day and must stop and reassure itself after a substantial move. A very small initial balance is, first, is the first indication of a potential double distribution trend day. Again, the more narrow the base, the easier it is to overwhelm the area and auction quickly to a new level. Point one, figure 2.7. In figure 2.7, the other time frame seller extends the range down in F and G periods. Point two, lower prices were accepted as value forms below the original value area in a new distribution. Separated by a single TPO price, prints point three. This new trading range generally holds throughout the day, often providing useful reference points and good trading opportunities for day traders. The single prints separating the two distributions in a double distribution trend day become an important reference point near the end of the day. If price auctions back into the single prints during the latter time periods, in effect making them double prints, something has changed. And in the second distribution in the something has changed and in the second distribution it is no longer accepted as value for an example in the double distribution trend in figure 2.7 a price probe into f period single prints point number four would indicate that a strong other time frame buyer had entered or that other time frame seller conviction that caused the initial range extension is no longer present. Neutral day. When a neutral day occurs, it means that the other time frame buyer and seller are not far apart in the view of value. When they have similar views of value, the market balances auctioning back and forth between them. During a neutral day, both other time frame participants are present. If only, if only one were active, there would be an imbalance and a trend or a normal variation type of day would occur. It is important to keep in mind that while the other time frame buyer and seller may be close in their perception of value, they rarely agree on the same price. Just as the automobile producer rarely agrees on the long-term car buyers, rarely agrees with the long-term car buyers. Therefore, the other time frame buyer and seller do not trade with each other, they trade with the local, the middleman. On a neutral day, the base with is somewhat between a trend day and a normal day. It is not so small to be easily upset, but it's not wide enough to hold the day's extremes. 
This salient feature on the neutral day is the fact that both the other time frame buyer and other time frame sellers are active as it evidenced by range extension on both sides of initial balance points three and four. This indicates the market imbalance, point number four, where all time frames are involved. There are two types of neutral days, neutral center and neutral extreme. On a neutral center day, the day closes within the price of the middle range. indicating a lack of confidence and a balance between the other time frame buyer and seller. On a neutral extreme day, price closes on either high or low extreme for the day, indicating a hypothetical victory in the day or in the day time frame battle for control between the other time frame buyer and seller. If the day closes on upper extreme on a neutral day, then the other time frame buyer has higher directional conviction. Conversely, if the close is on the lows, the other time frame seller has exhibited greater confidence. Day type summary. The chart in figure 2.10, which is this one here, displays the type of day on a horizontal axis and the level of directional conviction that day exhibits on the vertical axis. The result is a gradually ascending line from lowest conviction to highest from a non-trend day to a trend day. Again, the labels we have given the types are not carved in stone, but are used only for the learning process. What should become clear is that by monitoring a day's conviction very early in the trading sessions, traders can quickly begin to understand and visualize how the day will develop. At this point, you know the, the basic object facts and features about the market profile. Like David, the, the novice piano player, you have learned the foundation for further learning, but there is a long way to go. In the following sections, the concepts you have learned as a novice will serve as the foundation for understanding the market. Like the staff and notes are the foundation for understanding music. Remember to actively interpret and combine your new knowledge with your experience in the market. Do not put the facts you have learned as a novice away and say, oh, okay, what's next? The learning process is an ongoing synthesis, each part fitting into the next like a puzzle. Trying to become an expert trader without a continuum between the stages is like trying to put together a puzzle with all the pieces the same color. Look for the big picture. That is the end of chapter two. So that is where we will call it today. So great stuff. Um, any questions or any reviews definitely type them in and we will go over them tomorrow when we read the book start at chapter three advanced beginner other than that those of you guys on youtube you guys have a wonderful day and i will catch you all